was the name of it? The tele, tele camera there. Oxford. Oh, you went to Oxford, yeah. Is that noted for the dumb ones? No, oh, a smart one, you see, that smart one. Well, it's pretty hard when you're programmed to believe you're the smart one not to be smart all the time. Not you, of course, but others may fall into this trap, you see. No, but so... so no, but? You just said no, but. Oh, my gosh. That's 40 more. <laughs> I did not agree to the no's. Oh, he's negotiating some poor child with cancer is not going to get the $20 they deserve. Is that what you just did? You just did that, didn't you? Wasn't that terrible? It's like a vice. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're trying to get better uh, with behavior, you say that in your book, Triggers, um, that adult behavioral change is one of the hardest things to do. Why is change so hard? Well, in many ways, the more successful we become, the harder it is. Any human or any animal will replicate behavior that's followed by positive reinforcement. The more successful we are in life, the more positive reinforcement we get. And the more we fall into something called the superstition trap. I behave this way, I am successful. Therefore, I must be successful because I behave this way. Wrong. Everyone I work with is incredibly successful, and they all behave the way they behave. And they're all successful because of doing many things right, or they wouldn't be there. And they're all successful in spite of doing a few things that are stupid. Well, the world is changing very rapidly, so I think now it's very important to focus on learning as a lifetime avocation. Um, in an old world, thing was, things were much more stable. Leadership was typically domestic, not global. Technology wasn't changing nearly as rapidly. You didn't have to build alliances and partnerships like today. In today's new world, most of us manage knowledge workers. Now, what's the definition of a knowledge worker? They know more about what they're doing than their boss does. Well, if I manage someone who knows more about what they're doing than I do, I have to constantly ask, listen, learn, and grow. I can't just tell them what to do and how to do it because I don't know myself. Hello, everyone. This is Mustafa. And today on Passion Sundays, we have an amazing surprise for you. Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. He's world's number one executive coach. He's here because he's very, very, very passionate. And the first question I'm actually going to ask him so, Dr. Marshall, tell us, how do you get all this passion? Well, you know, today you were there, and I gave a nice talk in front of, I think, what, 300 people or so today. And one of the most common questions I get is that, how do you have so much energy? People don't say this, but they say, you're an old man. You've been flying on an airplane for 18 hours. Thank you for saying it, so I don't have yeah, to say that. That's right. That's what I'm thinking. How do you get so much energy? Well, before I speak, I always do a chant every day. It helps give me energy. Can, can would, we, would you like to learn the chant? Oh God, I'm sure everybody would like to learn that. Okay, breathe. Ah, do your hands like this. Ah, and the chant goes like this. Ah. There's no, no business, business like show business like. Show business. <laughs> <laughs> so every day before I work, I tell myself it's show time. You know, I, Hi, it's Ramit Sethi here from I Will Teach You To Be Rich, Growth Lab, and Brain Trust. Today, I'm thrilled and very honored to have as my guest, Marshall Goldsmith. Okay, I wanna talk about habit number two in your book. Habit number two is adding too much value. Mm. Already counterintuitive just by the name alone. Right. What does it mean? Well, a classic problem of smart people, particularly, especially technical, technically engineers, scientists, electrical engineers, the worst, mathematics majors, terrible, adding too much value. Mm. Now, what does that mean? I'm young, smart, enthusiastic, I come to you with an idea. Now, you think it's a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, our natural tendency is to say, well, that's a nice idea, why don't you add this to it? Well, the quality of the idea may go up 5%, my commitment to execute the idea may go down 50%. Why is that? It's no longer, it's no longer my idea, now it's your idea. Uh. My commitment goes away. Because if I asked you, you know, Marshall, what, your val what are your values? It's, it's a hard question. If you asked me that, I wouldn't know mm -hmm. necessarily how to answer. But mm -hmm. when you think about it in terms of your heroes and you, you list their qualities, 
what you're basically doing is defining your values and your values become the foundation for your life design. Very Without your values, how would you know how to choose one thing over another? It's your values that help you guide through your, your life design. Yeah, it's so. interesting because I never thought of it. I give all my material away. Yes. So all my material you can copy, share, don't know, duplicate, it's all free. And uh, yeah, because I'm a teacher and that's what I value. I'll tell you an interesting story about generosity when I was young. Uh, there was something back in Kentucky called the March of Dimes Bread Drive. And my high school was one of the more poor schools in the, in the area and I was put in charge and what you're supposed to do is knock on the door and say, uh, would you make a donation? And if people make a donation, then you give them this loaf of bread. So I told my team, which ended up, we ended up raising more money than any school in the county. I told my team, we're going to do something different. Give them the bread. They're going to throw the bread away anyway at the end of the day. <laughs> if they're too poor to give you the money, give them the bread. And then you just give them the bread and you say, if you want to make a donation, you know, that would be nice. We raise more money than anyone. <laughs> well, to me, it's demeaning to try to bribe someone with a loaf of bread. If you give me money, I will give you a loaf of bread. It's demeaning. So I sort of got this philosophy, give people the bread. You just give them the bread. You know, people are, I find most people are generous and nice people. And I, to be fair, have almost never been taken advantage of in my life. Nobody's ever cheated me. So I think it's a good philosophy of life. Just give people the bread and, you know, if they want to give you something back, great. If they don't want to give you something back, that's fine. Maybe they can't afford it. Maybe they're incapable of doing it. Who cares? Who cares? Don't worry about it. You know, just give them the bread. I went to a program and I was asked, who are my heroes? Turned out my heroes were all teachers. Then I was challenged, why are they your heroes? I thought they were so generous, they'd given me so much and they charged me nothing. Then I was given another challenge, take out their name and write in yours. Why aren't you more like them? I thought I should be. So I've made a decision. I'm going to mentor 15 coaches. These coaches are going to get access to everything I know, six or eight days worth of training. They're going to get to meet my CEO clients. One of them is Alan Mulally, former CEO of Ford, CEO of the year in the United States. He's going to spend six hours with our coaches at no charge. We're going to have a fantastic group of thought leaders, executives to help out this project. There's only one charge. The charge is this. When you become my age, you get a little older, you do the same thing. I've heard many managers say this, executives. Situational leadership, it changed the way I manage people. I think it's the most practical model you'd ever get for leadership. It's good for first-line supervisor, it's good for a CEO, it's good for everyone to know and understand. We're here to talk about a lot of things, but I'd be interested maybe walk down memory lane a little bit. Uh, one person we both have in common right. had a lot of influence on both of our careers was uh, Dr. Paul Hersey. I would have to say there's no way I would have achieved anything I achieved without him. He really was a key to my life. I met Paul when I was in my 20s and he was kind enough to let me follow him around to go to his programs and I just tried to learn what he did. Then one day he became double booked. So he calls me and says, Marshall, can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, well, I need help. Can you do this? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll pay $1,000 for one day. I was making $15,000 for one year. That was 39 years ago. I was 28 years old. You know what I said? Sign me up, coach. <laughs> so I go did a program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. They were very angry when I showed up <laughs> because I wasn't him. Right. But I got ranked first place of all the speakers. And then Paul called me up and he called them up and was just getting ready to get his butt handed to him. But they said, well, we were very angry, but Marshall got ranked first place to the speakers. Do you want to send him to do another one? So Paul said, do you want to do this again? I said, Paul, sign me sign up. Me That's up. how I got into executive education. <laughs>